My name is Ivo Ganchev, and I'm a junk professor at Beijing Union University. Today, I want to talk to you about globalization, focusing on two different aspects of this phenomenon, its history and its discontents. So to get you started, what is globalization? There are many different debates in the academic world on how ancient or how modern this phenomenon is. If you think of it more simplistically, for instance, in terms of trade, you can see evidence that people traded different objects since ancient times and they had different routes that made it possible. But if you think about the term in the way that we use it today, meaning the word globalization, in fact, it was first used in 1930, appearing in a paper on education. Gradually, during the 20th century, it became more popular in the social sciences, and it really entered the mainstream discourse when Levitt popularized it by relating it to its contemporary economic meaning. So he was writing about the globalization of markets. Now, when you think of globalization, there are many different dimensions of this phenomenon. So there is cultural globalization, economic globalization, political globalization, etc. But today we're going to focus primarily on the centrality of economic globalization by covering its history and also debates on this phenomenon. So there are many different definitions of economic globalization and some of them are more neutral. So for instance, you can read the first one by Gao. Economic globalization refers to the increasing interdependence of world economies as a result of the growing scale of cross-border trade of commodities and services, flow of international capital, and wide and rapid spread of technologies. So this is a broad economic definition of globalization. Now, when you think of another perspective, though, from a practical standpoint, you can see, for instance, the former director of the Third World Network, Martin Kaur, who was from Malaysia, and he worked for the majority of his life uh, on shaping policies for developing countries and development. He says globalization is what we in the Third World have for several centuries called colonization. So this is something that shifts the perspective here, and you can see how clearly from the perspective of developing countries there is a power aspect, the power relations aspect and relations of domination that also have to do with the phenomenon of globalization. Now when you think of another angle to globalization you can see the third definition here on the slide. It's the process of world shrinkage, of distances getting shorter, of things moving closer. It pertains to the increasing ease which, with which somebody on one side of the world can interact to mutual benefit with somebody on the other side of the world. So you can see that it also has implications in terms of the way that we perceive space and time and in terms of the way that we interact with each other. Now there are also other definitions, for instance you can see the one in the middle by Harvey that are more abstract and they talk about the compression of time and space. And there are also definitions that speak about globalization as a worldwide phenomenon and in terms of its relationship to international political economy. So you can see, for instance, the definition by Cox here, which reads, the characteristics of the globalization trend include the internationalizing of production, the new international division of labor, new migratory movements from, north to, from south to north, the new competitive environment that accelerates these processes and the internationalizing of the state, making states into agencies of the globalizing world. So that's a perspective that relates the concept of states to globalization and to economic processes and also relates to international political economy as a field. So based on these definitions, we can see that there are many ways of conceptualizing this phenomenon. There are many angles through, the, through which you can think about it. And it's not really clear in the academic community whether globalization is a force or a debate. You can do your own research and find also many other definitions of globalization which will perhaps reveal to you different angles to this phenomenon. I want to talk to you about globalization from a historical perspective, offering a very, very brief summary of how we got to where we are today.
So the first step in this process was the creation of world maps. So the moment when we actually discovered all of the world and we could put it in one place was the starting point which gave the initial spark for the globalization movement of today. And it's of course related to the explorers, to Columbus, to Vasco da Gama, to Marco Polo's travels to China and back, etc. Now, after world maps were first created, then you had a process of conquest whereby stronger nations turned into empires by gradual conquest and colonization. And uh, you can also see that Europe developed largely for instance, after the 1500s as a result of this process. Now, the third step in the process was that these empires had an economic dimension that had considerable implications both from for the empire state and for the states that were conquered. So you can see that empires started to establish what we call chartered companies. So a chartered company is formed by the means of a special charter granted by the head of state, which means the king or the queen. And it enjoyed exclusive rights and privileges, usually in resource-rich areas. Some examples of these companies were, for instance, the British East India Company, the British East Africa Company, German East Africa Company, etc. And it's worth noting that some companies, which are particularly famous like the British East India Company, had things like their own flag and even their own army. So they were essentially operating something that was almost like a state within a state because they had so many special rights. Now this changed the way that economic relations were actually formed between empires and colonized territories. The fourth step in this process is actually the result of decolonization. So we moved from a period of dominance, from a period where small territories were able to control large territories through means of technology to a period where you have a lot more independent states in the world. So in terms of international relations, the way that people from what we call the English school would term this transition is one from dominance to hegemony. Or it's something that in Chinese would be termed a transition from Qiangqian to a, a transition to Baqian. And in the world after World War II, you had a lot less organized violent conflict. So you had the whole field of international relations, the whole international community coming up with different mechanisms of mitigating war. And you had projects like the United Nations developing fairly successfully. So economic benefit became the primary consideration of states and military supremacy is something that actually uh, took a back seat. So in this era, we are in a much more peaceful time and we're thinking about making profit rather than conquering new territories because there are many more new ways of making profit that are easier and that also uh, tend to yield much greater benefit. Now, another point here is that population matters again. And if you consider the characteristics of the historical times that we live in, you're going to figure out that differences in technological development shrunk considerably from the colonial times until today. So before you had much more differences in terms of the development of different weapons, in terms of the development of ships that could travel further than the differences that we have today, partly because of the internet and the area of informational and technologies, we're able to access all kinds of new developments around the world and it's very difficult to have a technological advantage over other nations. That takes me to the final two steps of the process which resulted in essentially economic globalization. So these are steps five and step six. So first we had the end of the gold standard. So until that point every single dollar that was printed in the United States was supposedly backed by a certain amount of gold. And that meant that the US could only print a limited amount of dollars based on the gold reserves that they have. But after Richard Nixon changed the US policy and removed the gold standard with the US as a global currency, that meant that the US could print a new amount of dollars and would, could increase the creation of wealth worldwide. 
This was followed by a development of economic liberalism. And this development partly followed the uh, idea of an aspiration to wealth because a lot of new wealth was created. There was this new opportunity to get a part of it for states which wanted to uh, rise up the hierarchy in international relations or businesses which wanted to develop their models internationally and make more money internationally for individuals who aspire to their personal dreams and who aspire to become entrepreneurs and businessmen. And this essentially resulted in a wave of support for economic liberalism. Yet the economic development of nation states was at different starting points after World War II. And some of them had ample resources to the market and some of them had developed industries, so they had a head start ahead of other nations. So out of this process, what we ended up with is economic globalization, where we have the dollar as a currency that is recognized and accepted worldwide, and of course a few other currencies, the British pound, the Japanese yen, the Chinese renminbi more recently, and also obviously the euro. Uh, but we also have this aspiration towards uh, global economic development, towards international markets, etc. Now, this resulted to an extent uh, into the dominance of neoliberalism for a few decades, and I would actually say perhaps until most definitely until the late 90s, and uh, likely also until, until more recently, depending on the region that you're looking at in the world. And uh, neoliberalism is a school of thought that assigns a very limited economic role to the states. So essentially it argues that the states should define property rights and enforce contracts and regulate the money supply while giving to people a lot of individual uh, freedoms in terms of doing business and deciding how to trade, uh, removing the restrictions on capital so they can move money freely, etc. Now clearly this means that you're essentially constructing a more integrated global economy. And at some level, this might benefit individuals who are very entrepreneurial, but at another, this also removes some of the protections for certain communities that might not be doing as well in the global economy. Two institutions that were central to neoliberalism and its development were the IMF and the World Bank. Now, the IMF, or the International Monetary Fund, provides loans to address the issues with balances of payments for different countries. And the World Bank provides loans for governments who want to develop projects and programs related to development. Now, the way that these two institutions resulted in the dominance of liberalism was a lot of these loans were conditional. So in order for states to receive these loans, they had to accept conditions of certain political reforms that they would go through in subsequent years. Now, this whole period, this whole transition, resulted into what Harvard economist Nanny Roderick calls hyper-globalization. And it has also attracted uh, some opponents to this phenomenon who speak about globalization and its discontents, as famously Joseph Stiglitz uh, entitled his book. So first you have the idea that international Financial institutions, the IMF, the WTO, and the World Bank lack any necessary checks and balances. So, of course, these institutions are providing certain amounts of money and asking for certain types of reforms, but who is there to check whether these reforms are working? And even if some of them are not working, then what is anybody going to do about it? Would anybody reverse the reforms? Would anybody blame the WTO and the IMF? Well, the answer is no. So they had a considerable amount of freedom without any considerable checks and balances to back it up. Then you also had the idea that we're having global governance without global government. And this is an idea that came from Joe Stiglitz, who claims that the IMF's reckless, well, he calls it reckless liberalization, privatization, and deregulation Violate, violate the sovereignties of developing countries. So for instance, if a developing country requires uh, a, another amount of money, a new amount of money to make a payment, what they have to do is take a loan from the IMF and they have to accept these reforms even if they're not 
very happy with their content or even if they don't want to liberalize well what if they wanted to develop a certain industry and protect for instance the automobile industry or the manufacturing industry well then they still have to accept these conditions and proceed with the reforms now these phenomena have resulted into an increasingly big ratio of wealthiest to poorest countries. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, as Danny Roderick notes in his book about hyperglobalization, the ratio was about 2 to 1. And today it's at about 80 to 1. So we're talking about an increasingly growing ratio between the richest and the poorest uh, countries in the world. And this has also uh, been a phenomenon that's developed within societies. And recently we've had Tomato Petit's famous book on capital, uh, which has ideas like the one that's right here at the end of the slide. When the rate of return on capital R is greater than the rate of economic growth G over the long term, the result is concentration of wealth and this unequal distribution of wealth causes social and economic instability. So essentially what Tamapi Kuti is trying to tell us is that there has been an increasing concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of what we call sometimes today the top 1% or the top 10% and we've had the bottom 90% or the bottom 99% uh, that have an increasingly smaller amount of wealth in comparison to the richest and the highest uh, class. Now, of course, there are also arguments in defense of globalization, uh, which are worth considering. Now, you have, for instance, the Cato Institute, which is a liberal-minded think tank that argues that globalization, despite its shortcomings, despite generating these increasing gaps between the rich and the poor and the upper class and the lower class, it still generates a large overall accumulation of wealth worldwide. So even though the poor people might be poor in comparison to the richer ones, they have more wealth in terms of monetary uh, possessions or in terms of material objects than they did before. Another similar line of argument in Steven Pinker's book is that there is less poverty and less violence worldwide if you look at statistics. And then you also have libertarian arguments that claim that uh, critique has been actually the, the result of interpreting government failures as market failures. And in fact, these uh, points that people are presenting as market failures were the failures of certain governments to manage their own politics. So in any case, you have uh, one set of arguments against economic hyperglobalization and another set of arguments which is in favor of maintaining globalization. So, Given that there is such a fierce debate, why did economic liberalism continue relatively smoothly despite the backlash against it? Well, a couple of main reasons are, first of all, that there were still some countries and some people that aspired to market liberalization because there were some success stories. So if you look at, for instance, Chile's economy in Latin America, it was one of the big success stories of market liberalization, and this inspired others to try and follow in the same footsteps despite the failure of others. And the other factor is that the uh, US-led policies such as the Washington consensus and the conditionality that came with loans from the IMF were imposed from above on a number of states and forced them to open towards foreign investment. So essentially if they wanted to take these loans there was no alternative partly because the world was for instance in the 90s what we call unipolar with only one uh, great power that was able to provide them this funding or before that during the times of the US and the Soviet Union even though it was bipolar it was primarily the US that had the spare funds to provide to these countries so given these ideas about globalization which range broadly in terms of, uh, of, of different positions on the subject you have to think about it and decide whether you personally are in support or whether you are in opposition to globalization. Who do you think that globalization benefits the most and who does it benefit the least? And does that matter? How does it matter? How does it matter in terms of the international society, in terms of relations between countries, and how does it matter within societies? How does it matter 
in terms of the way that national policies are decided. And finally, it's still worth considering whether we are now still in the process of globalization or whether we have moved towards new times of deglobalization with the rise of, for instance, nationalist movements in Europe or the rise of protectionism uh, in terms of Donald Trump's policy or whether we are actually in a new era of reglobalization where we will see a globalization of a new kind. I hope that you can do some of your own research and have a think about these questions and I'll speak to you next time.